Real Virginia is produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Farming, it's all good. Visit our website at vafarmbureau.org. Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic to Appalachia, home in my heart always. Hello everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the wonderful people who produce all the foods we enjoy. Horse lovers from around the nation will be celebrating an important anniversary this spring right here in Virginia. We have some tips for you on how to keep your houseplants healthy in the winter and how did our pioneer ancestors keep food on the table throughout the winter months. We have some lessons from the past to share. Welcome back everyone. We're here at Meadow Event Park in Caroline County, Virginia. It is the birthplace of Secretariat where we're going to have a wonderful event coming up at the end of the month. He is known as one of the greatest racehorses that ever lived. It's been nearly 40 years since Secretariat, a chestnut brown thoroughbred born in Caroline County, won the historic Triple Crown. His unbelievable performances in the Kentucky Derby, Preakness, and Belmont Stakes remain the benchmark for the sport of horse racing. He is the only horse in the history of the Triple Crown to break the track records of all three races, the Derby, the Preakness, and the Belmont. And of course, everybody remembers his Belmont when he won it by 31 lengths, two minutes and 24 seconds, so far in front of the field, it was like he was in another zip code. And people said it was like watching Pegasus fly. Commonwealth Fairs and Events of Virginia and Secretariat.com of Louisville, Kentucky are joining together to recognize Secretariat with a birthday celebration at the Meadow Event Park in Doswell, Virginia, March 29th and 30th. This land, once owned by Christopher Chinnery, was a growing stud farm and racehorse breeding operation. It produced both Secretariat and Reva Ridge, who won two of the three Triple Crown races in 1972. You can see the uh, yearling barn where he would have been raised, and also Reva Ridge, who was also a very important horse uh, we should talk about. And you can see the stallion barn where some of the stallions that were there, where they would have stayed. One of the event highlights will be the return of Penny Chinnery, Secretariat's owner to the birthplace of this legendary stallion. Miss Chinnery is known as the First Lady of Racing and will be on hand to greet fans and sign autographs along with others who were instrumental in Secretariat's success. Ron Turcott, his Hall of Fame jockey. Charlie Davis, who was his exercise rider at, at the track. Um, the, that Secretariat team plus the local uh, men who were the grooms for Secretariat in the early days and some of the, the riders, they're all going to be there inside that building, signing autographs and meeting fans. The Secretariat birthday celebration at the Meadow will begin on Friday, March 29th with a private Winter Circle reception that evening. This will be followed by a public showing of the Disney film Secretariat on the grounds. An all-day program is in store for Saturday, March 30th, including autograph sessions, sale of official Secretariat merchandise, narrated tram tours of the farm, featuring historic barns and Secretariat's original foaling shed, and a taste of Virginia Showcase. Fans will even have the opportunity to meet local Secretariat descendants. A grandson and a great-grandson who will be there. Um, you can be able to pet them and, and feed them some carrots and apples and that type of thing. For information on the event, go to secretariatsmeadow.com. Virginia is home to more than 97,000 horses scattered across the state, but the highest concentrations are in suburban areas, particularly Falkir and Loudoun counties just southwest of Washington, D.C. There are more than 10,000 horses in each of these localities. The economic impact of the state's horse industry in the state totals more than $1.2 billion. Almost half of Virginia's horse population is used solely for pleasure riding, compared to 100 years ago when most were primarily used for production agriculture or general transportation. Being on my side, being a consumer, there's a lot of talk about what goes on at farms. How could you make me feel better as a mother knowing that what I'm buying is safe? You know, we have the opportunity to eat 
the pork and the beef that we grow on our farm. But I'm just like you, I go to the grocery store each and every week and have to make food choices. When I enter the grocery store, I'm selecting dairy products or fresh fruits and vegetables, and I'm depending on a farmer to produce that for me, and I have confidence in them. The most important thing is, is the health of, of the animal. My family eats the pork that I would sell to you. We're accountable for everything we do. When we sit down to a juicy pork chop hot off the grill, it pleases us as farmers that we not only can provide that for our own children, but we're working for you and we want to provide you with healthy choices. activity a day and eating well can help get your child healthy. So keep them active and eating well every day. Skip a rope Saturday, freeze tag Friday, tap dance Thursday, whole greens Wednesday, try a veggie Tuesday, let's move on the next day, the sweet Sunday. Eat well and move a lot. Today is Hot. Saturday, yeah. today is Saturday. All the healthy children, all the healthy children. Get ideas, get involved. Get going at letsmove.gov. That's letsmove.gov. Many gardeners keep house plants all year long, and Mark Viet has some suggestions on how to help them thrive in the garden. Many of us have house plants that we've had in our home year after year after year, and a lot of us put them outdoors after the threat of cold weather in the spring. Now, you might be one of those lucky few who have that outdoor tropical hibiscus, and maybe you brought it inside in the fall, and you get a beautiful, bright, sunny window. It, for some of us, may still be blooming like this, but that's not common, that's sort of unusual. On the other hand, a lot of us are gonna have plants that we have brought inside in the fall before really cold weather hits, and you know, we might keep them in the basement, keep them in a cold room, we might keep them in a heated garage, and they may look sort of like this. Now this is known as Angel's Trumpet. This plant gets bigger and bigger every year. It's a beautiful hanging, either white or pink, or even uh, red bloom. Some are single, some are double, extremely fragrant. This is a plant that in many cases loses its leaves. What do you do when it starts getting big? Well, after winter, you cut it back and it looks like this. And it will continue to grow this spring, especially after you put it outdoors. And then sometime in the summer, you're gonna see these beautiful hanging flowers that are almost 10 to 12 inches long. Early spring, late winter is a great time to cut it back. Really, when you're trying to rejuvenate plants, you sort of want to cut them back before their active growing season. So if they're sort of asleep in the winter, you'll wait till winter's over, and then you'll cut them back. On the other hand, there are other plants that you might consider trimming, and one of them is the Mandevilla. Mandevilla is a very popular plant that we grow outdoors in the warm months. And to really get great producing Mandevilla, it's better to have a plant that's one, two, three years old. Because by the time you buy them in the spring, each and every year, the plants really aren't that big. This is a plant when you bring it indoors in the fall, as with many of your plants you're trying to overwinter, you let them approach dryness. Pretty much some of them I don't even water at all. In fact, they'll lose a lot of leaves. Sometimes you won't see any leaves. Before you bring them outdoors, when temperatures warm up, like let's say 45 or 50 degrees at night, what you're gonna wanna do is trim it back. So you just come in here, cut it back, just like this, try to cut back to a growing point or a bud. It will continue to grow, and it'll actually grow up to another six feet throughout the season. Mandevilla, great plant, can handle freezing temperatures, but I like to prune them back right before uh, you bring them outdoors in the spring. It's the best time to prune them. If you have an overgrown plant, let's say it's a fern, the best time to redivide them 
or at least rejuvenate them is in the spring. This plant has grown so much that it's bulging the pot in many areas. So just take your hands or your fist. You might even need a hammer, but you have to somehow figure out how can I get this out of the pot. What you might find is you're gonna have to take a sharp knife very carefully and just cut down the side of the pot just like this, so you can just pull, and you have this plant right here. A couple things you can do with this fern. The easiest and the quickest is to take another one of my favorite tools, just one of these little hand saws, and if I don't really want to redivide it, I just want to go ahead and repot it, I'll come in. And this is a saw I use just for repotting, because especially if there's gravel, you don't want to use it to trim your trees. And you just cut the bottom part. Then you take your fern and you repot it, and maybe a pot about an inch or two inches larger. And if you want to make two or three or four of these, you can go ahead, cut them up, and repot them in smaller parts. I'm Mark Viet. Join me next time in the garden. For more garden tips, go to inthegardenradio.com. Up next on Real Virginia, one of the first crops of spring is sugar snap peas. We've got an easy recipe to help you enjoy them in the heart of the home. When you throw away money on wasted electricity, you're throwing away everything you could have bought with it. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. Sugar snap peas and pasta are a great way to enjoy the season's first crop. Kendra Bailey Morris has more in the heart of the home. Hi, I'm Kendra Bailey Morris and welcome to the heart of the home. Today we're going to be making a very decadent pasta dish, I'm not going to lie. And it's going to be using fresh Virginia peas, which you can find in farmers markets across the state, uh, usually around April and May, and you can buy them either shelled or if you're lucky enough, some farmers markets will sh shell them for you. Um, if for whatever reason you can't get a, a hold of the fresh ones, you can always use frozen for this dish, but I highly recommend the fresh ones because they're bigger and they're juicier and they have a, a lot more flavor. So what we're gonna do is um, begin by making a type of Alfredo sauce, essentially, that's gonna have gorgonzola cheese in it, a little bit of Parmesan, and accented with the peas. And so I'm gonna begin by adding about a cup and a half of heavy cream. You could also use half and half if you wanted to. I'm just gonna stir this around just a little bit, keep it moving. And what we're gonna do with the heavy cream here is reduce it by about half. In the meantime, I'm gonna mince up some garlic. I've got two small garlic cloves. You could certainly add more if you're a garlic person like I am. And I'm just gonna loosely mince these up. So you can see my heavy cream is bubbling away. You want that, you have your heat on about medium high or so. In the meantime, I'm gonna go ahead and add my garlic into this. So it basically is flavoring the heavy cream. Stir this around just a bit. There we go. I would not substitute light cream or fat-free heavy cream or anything like that. And with dishes like this, you just gotta go there. Just go full fat or go home. Um, it's a wonderful dish and it's definitely something that if you tried to substitute um, a non-natural fat, I don't know how it exactly turn out when you're going to do this type of reduction on the stove top. A lot of times it tends to curdle and do weird things, so you don't want that to happen. Now what I have here is about a cup or so, cup and a half, of uh, five ounces to be exact, of gorgonzola cheese. And this is a gorgonzola dolce, which is a very creamy, very rich, um, very uh, flavorful, pungent cheese. It's also quite salty, so you don't want to add any salt to this until you have tasted it with the cheese, 
and we're gonna add some Parmesan as well, and both of those have a tendency to be salty on their own. So you wanna be careful with that. I'm gonna add this in. And this is a really great melting cheese. You're gonna see it. It's gonna also thicken up the sauce really nicely. I've also got a half cup of freshly grated Parmesan cheese. I'm gonna add that in now. Like I said, this isn't a low fat dish, so a little bit goes a long way. In the meantime, while this is going, you would, this is about the time you would wanna drop your pasta in boiling water. And I've gone ahead and already parboiled this to an al dente, because this is gonna be tossed into this pan, and so you don't want it to be too overcooked, or by the time it gets into your pan, it's going to fall apart. Uh, the beautiful part about pasta is having a little toothsome to it, a toothsome taste, uh, texture to it rather. And if you overcook it, you're gonna definitely lose that. Um, I'm adding a little bit of red pepper just because I like it. This is optional, it's just dried red pepper. I'm also gonna be pretty generous here with the black pepper. I love black pepper, lots of it in Alfredo sauces. It just really balances out the heavy creaminess really, really nicely. And you can see now that my blue cheese is really starting to melt, looks wonderful. And as it's melting, that heavy cream is starting to properly reduce. All right. Okay. And this is a time you would add in your peas. If you were happening to use frozen peas, you would obviously want to cook them a little bit longer. Fresh peas, really just like a minute or so. If that, you don't need much more time because you don't want them to get too mushy. You want them, again, to be a bit toothsome. And this is already looking really, really, really pretty. Okay, my cheese is melted, and now I'm gonna add my pasta in. Because I like black pepper, I'm doing a little bit more. This is optional. And this is the easy part. These, this pasta is pretty much cooked all the way through. Like I said, I've, I boiled it to a proper al dente. So it really doesn't need a whole lot more time than this. And you're just gonna toss it around. Obviously you need a large saute pan for this. And when you're ready to serve, you can obviously serve directly from here. Or what I like to do is go ahead and just put it right back in the bowl and serve it that way. Give us a little toss around. Obviously, if you like, you can add a little extra Parmesan cheese on top. You could certainly add some herbs into this, some fresh herbs, some freshly grown Virginia herbs. If you have some parsley on top, or maybe just a little bit of oregano, sage, anything like that would be nice right about now. And there you have it, a pasta with peas and gorgonzola cheese in an Alfredo sauce. I'm Kendra Bailey Morris. Let's get cooking. Recipes from the heart of the home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at vafarmbureau.org. Gardeners call them cold crops. They're the first plants to thrive in the cold ground during cold nights that are typically in early spring. After the winter months without fresh vegetables, cold hardy crops like broccoli, cauliflower, onions, kale, and peas are a welcome sight for many consumers and chefs. It's traditional in many parts of Virginia to plant peas as early as March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. And you'll be able to find cold crops very soon at many local farmers markets. Now that more growers are adding season extending greenhouses to their local food operations. Enjoy! Let's change the perception of modern farming and ranching from negative to one that inspires a nation. To rebuild the pride of farming that has existed for generations and propel forward what's possible. It's time to build upon what we all share instead of focusing on what sets us apart. Let's build a collective voice that is stronger than any one individual's. We need to cultivate the higher ground and lead the conversation about safe food. Now is the time to send an invitation where everyone has a seat at the table. 
let's rally around the dinner table and serve up some food for thought. Because it's time to feed people's minds as well as their bodies. We're all in this together. So let's get started. Our forefathers took great steps to preserve food throughout the winter. And as Veronica Rollmoser reports, those same methods can be used today. In today's society, those who want fresh fruits and vegetables in the dead of winter head to their local grocery store or even to a farmer's market. But if the year is 1730 or 1830, or even 1930, people could only enjoy fresh produce during the season that it was produced. So if you wanted the taste of raspberries any other time than raspberry season, you had to do something with them to preserve them. Karen Becker is a costumer with the Frontier Culture Museum of Virginia. She demonstrates for visitors how the settlers preserved their foods, techniques that we still use hundreds of years later. Today, people many times make jams and jellies and preserves and the way the food is preserved usually a fruit is preserved is by means of cooking that fruit with a great deal of sugar the technique is entirely the same and all that has changed in the making of preserves is what kind of container we put it in how much right there mm. Mm -mm -mm. that's good and that's true of most food preservation methods, including fermenting fresh vegetables. The process of making sauerkraut really hasn't changed over the years. We still slice it up real thin, we still add salt, we still add caraway seeds. It still gets pounded or bruised. The only change today is that most commercially prepared sauerkraut has been pasteurized packaged in a plastic bag and canned or frozen. While the convenience of buying cabbage and other fresh vegetables at the grocery store is nice, Becker says preserving these foods actually provides more health benefits. The process of fermenting cabbage is not only a good preservation technique, it also uh, releases even more of the nutrients that are found in cabbage than any other preparation technique would, would do for cabbage. Perhaps one of the easiest methods of food preservation is drying. When we're talking about drying as a preservation technique, of course it was used heavily pre-industrial age, pre-electricity age, pre-commercially prepared food age. Foods are still being dried today. You can go to the grocery store and buy dried cranberries and of course raisins or dried fruits. Those are all processed commercially. For the home producer, the main thing that has changed again in drying is the equipment that they use. Becker says the other main difference is the length of time the foods are meant to be kept. In the 1800s, I'm pretty convinced that the food that was preserved in the spring and the summer and the fall was meant to be eaten the following winter. So it only had to be kept for at most seven or eight months. Nowadays, commercial factories that preserve canned food and things like that, they're kind of in it for the long haul. And those foods are good for two and three or more years. Many people today don't dry their own beans, make their own preserves, ferment their own cabbage, make their own pickles. Many people do. And none of it is rocket science. At the Frontier Culture Museum of Virginia in Stanton, I'm Veronica Romoser. We're so glad you took the time to join us this month to help celebrate the bounty Virginia has to offer, whether it's in your home, your garden, or your landscape. This truly is what real Virginia is all about. So for everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a good month. Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic to Appalachia.